Great, so welcome to another class about the branch spaces. And finally, uh, today we will define uh, the branch space. Um, um, so in the book, the branch defines uh, um, his space. Well, of course, he, he didn't name it uh, the branch space, but he defines only in the L2 version, okay? And uh, a lot of work and, and nowadays uh, um, have been done in the LP version. So I would try to define the LP version uh, instead of just the L2, okay? Um, and uh, it seems that this LP version first appeared in a paper of Baranov, so, which will uh, right, com comment in a moment, but anyway, uh, so definition, so uh, first a function um, E, so every De Bruyne space comes with a, uh, a certain function E, which we call the hermit Biele function. So a function E uh, uh, entire, the analytic, the whole complex plane is said to be of Hermit Pillar. So it belongs to the Hermit Pillar class. If that's uh, the fundamental property of it. So whenever you take a point in the upper half plane, so the drawing should be something like, oh, I can use this. Um, whenever you take, so this would be the real line. Whenever you take a point here, Z, and you then mirror it to the lower half plane, then E of Z here, in model i is greater than e of z here. Okay. Um, that's what this inequality is saying because recall that this function here is defined as um, e of z bar bar. Okay. The star is my standard notation for it, the double. Uh, conjugate uh, thing. Okay, so that's the what's uh, called the Hermit Biller function. Uh, just a side comment: if you go in the literature, maybe you will see this thing with a equality. So if you go in the literature, maybe you see something like this, and then you further ask that e. Uh, has no zeros in C plus, okay? If you just put the strict inequality like I did, then obviously this doesn't have any zeros in the upper half plane because this will always be greater than zero. Uh, but just a comment, you, if you search for it, then you maybe see the uh, lesser equal. Okay, so whenever you have an emit builder function, you can define uh, the De Bruyne space. So let me define here. So the LP De Bruyne space. Okay. So what is it? So the denotation will be like this, and then we'll define it for uh, one less so equal than P so equal to infinity. Okay, so this would be what? This would be the set of functions F entire, the entire function, uh, such that F over E and F star over E are both of bounded type in the upper half plane. Okay, whenever you have a function of bounded type, you can ask for its mean type. Um, 
And then you ask that the maximum of the mean type is less or equal than zero. So both have non-positive mean type. And uh, F over E belongs to LP on the real line. Okay, so that would be the class. Let me finish here. Okay, so we have like uh, three conditions, let's say. F entire, will, of course, would be that, but you have this first condition that F over E and F star over E are both a bounded type. Then you ask that they have an unpositive mean type and F over E belongs to LP, okay? So just to a quick uh, recall that whenever you have a function of bounded type, its mean type is just a limb soup when Y goes to infinity of log of whatever you trying to do, so moduli of that divided by y. So there is another formula for that. We saw two possible formulas. The other one was an integral over a, a, a half arc, circular arc in the upper half plane. And you send this circular arc um, to the infinity and you have a kind of a, a average over this arc. And that would be, after normalization, it would be also the mean type. Okay. So that's the space and what's the norm? We're gonna put the norm of F and this is space. And you always uh, drop the, the E here if E is to be understood by the context. Um, this will be of course just this thing. And this is if P is finite and if P is infinity. Oops, if this is infinity, then there is just a soup on the real line of F over E of X. Okay. Um, so that's the De Bruyne space. Uh, and then, well, definitely this is a vector space um, because, well, if you have a function of bounded type, we know that sum and products and quotients of function of bounded type are of bounded type. If you add uh, two functions of bounded type, then its mean, time is, mean type is less or equal than the max of the mean type between each term of the sum. Uh, this is one of the problems in the book. Uh, so therefore, this condition will also be satisfied for a sum of two functions in the space and also this thing, obviously. So this is a vector space though, for the complex numbers and, and it's a norm space, is this would be a norm. Of course, if this is uh, identically zero, it means that the function f is, will be identically zero, at least in some piece of the, of the real line. And therefore, f will be identically zero. The same thing as this. So it's a proper norm. So you can ask if the space is complete and we, we're gonna show that. Uh, and just another uh, comment, maybe here, that we are asking that f over e belongs to LP. In particular, it's integrable and also, I mean, uh, integrable in locally in intervals uh, on the real line. And also you're asking that this is finite. So suppose my function E has a real zero. If there is nothing in this condition uh, that says that E cannot have a real zero and it could be the case. And if that's the case, then you see by this condition that uh, any function in the space must have that zero as well. Otherwise, this wouldn't be uh, LP. Moreover, if the zero of E has multiplicity uh, 10, let's say, then F must have a zero at that point, at that real 
zero of e with the same multiplicity or higher because otherwise again it won't be in lp so that's the comment so if p of x naught is zero uh, so if x naught is a zero of e with multiplicity m, then any f in hp of e has a zero at the point. with uh, multiplicity m prime greater or equal than m. Okay. Um, so this is uh, the De Bruyne space. So let's uh, make me, so, so I wanna, what I want to do now is to show that uh, the Taylor-Vino space is recovered in this way, okay? So I want to give yet another definition for the Taylor-Vino space. We saw three, and I want to get yet another one, okay? Um, sorry, I've got one question. Yes. So in the definition above, um, in the hermit Bieler uh, class, um, do we also require it to be an increasing function of y? So like with the polyar classes or? Yeah, no. So uh, so this this is one of the conditions, I guess, in the polyar class. Uh, I think it was less so equal in the polyar class. And you ask yeah. further that you don't have zeros above. And there was uh, this inequality and then uh, with less or equal. And, and then what you, what you said, the, the function is not decreasing in this direction. And don't, we don't ask that. But for instance, uh, in most situations uh, in applications, uh, this function here will end up being the Poya class. Okay. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, so let me uh, see here. Yet another definition for BWP, should not be. So we saw a bunch, uh, so let me, uh, um, let me uh, just, just uh, stick with two for the moment. So um, we had our F, so all of the spaces F would be entire. But uh, so let me just drop that. So one was uh, that when you restrict to the real line, you have L2 and the support of the Fourier transform is contained in the interval minus BB. The other one was um, again, F entire, F in L2 on the line, but then you ask that the exponential type, which I always wrote right as tau of F is less or equal than two pi B. So the function has exponential type less or equal than two pi. The third one, which we saw some few classes ago, which was that F divided by EB, and I'll write what EB is in a moment. EB belongs to H2, the Hardy space of the upper half plane, where EB in this class would always be this exponential function here. Okay. It was the third definition we saw, okay? And what I'm claiming is that there is another one, which this is the, the Brown's space associated with the function EB, okay? So for that, um, I need to show, I need to uh, recall problem uh, 37, which is Crying's theorem. So problem 37 is just one uh, way in Crying's theorem 
there is a, a counter of that, which the branches doesn't ask in the problem, but we, we will have to use it. Okay, so, uh, so Prime's theorem, is the following, um, which is also problem, partially problem 37, which is uh, F is of exponential type if and only if F and F star are bounded type in the upper half plane. So actually, uh, so problem 37 is just this direction. If F and F star are bounded type, then F is of exponential type, okay? But if I additionally impose something, which you can deduce from the, just having F and F star in bounded type. If I additionally put that the integral of log plus of FT, one plus t squared dt is finite, then you can actually go back and this is equivalent, okay? So f is of exponential type and, and you have this integral finite here, the log of the integral, uh, log plus of f divided by the Poisson kernel is finite, then f f star is bounded type. Okay, in this situation, and if this is the case, which is also part of the problem, which is to show that the exponential type of F is actually the maximum between the mean types. Okay, so this is Prime's theorem, which, which uh, if we have time, we'll probably prove uh, uh, this theorem here, okay? So uh, we use problem uh, um, 37 to prove this direction, and then I will show this other part, which is uh, more tricky. Uh, we, if I recall correctly, this, uh, this uh, implication here, you have to, uh, send everything to the unit disk and do an argument and do a proof there and then go back to the upper half plane. Okay, there is, some, there is a trick to be made. But in any case, let me use that to show the claim I just made, which was that the Paley unit space is just uh, the H2B here, okay? If well, this would be true as well for, for P, um, but then I would have to drop this condition here because uh, for P larger than two, I can't really say that. I could say, but only in the sense of distributions, but I don't want to talk about now, but it, this would be true also for P, okay? So let me maybe write this. So why is that the case? Um, okay. Okay, so let me show that. So suppose uh, uh, we have, well, the condition on the line is always the same because recall that this function EB here um, is, uh, has a norm one on the real line. So the L2 condition on the line uh, would be the same between the Paley-Venus space here and the De Bruyne space there. So I just have to show that the exponential type can be translated into uh, uh, bounded type and vice versa. So that, and then you can see easily that, well, that's exactly what Crying's theorem is saying. Okay, so suppose, so if F, um, belongs uh, to the Paley-Venus space, let's say P2 pi B, 
uh, well, implies a bunch of things, but uh, one thing is that uh, it, well, it has exponential type, obviously less or equal than two pi b, okay? And also, since it's LP on the line, it will also imply, this is easy to show, that the log plus integrates against this. I mean, the function is LP on the line. So this integral is definitely will converge. I mean, taking the log is an overkill. We can we could even drop the log plus here. Okay, so therefore, uh, by um, Recrine's uh, result, what do we have? We have that F, just apply it plainly. Go for bounded type in the upper half plane, and moreover, the type of F equals the max of the mean types. Okay, but since EB EB is of bounded type, okay, if it's a function of bounded type, it's just an exponential. Uh, so therefore, if I divide it F um, by this function, it's still of bounded type, and we can measure the mean type, but the mean type of this function is b, uh, sorry, two pi b, okay? So, uh, so then the mean type of e, f over e of b, which we know is a bounded type now, so let me write that. So uh, f over e b, f star over e b, both a bounded type, because quotient of bounded, a function of bounded type is a bounded type. And you can compute its mean type. And that would be the mean type of the difference. Okay. But which you know, we know that it's less or equal than the type of F because the type is the maximum of both. And this is two pi B. And so the type is less or equal than two pi B. So this is less or equal than zero. And similarly, this thing is less or equal to zero, okay? So therefore we conclude that F belongs. To uh, the burn space, okay? And now we go, go back, well, basically uh, is the basically is the same thing. Well, if F belongs to the burn space, we do know that both these guys uh, have no negative mean type, but EB is of bounded type. So we conclude that the mean type, uh, so the mean type of F, EB is a bounded type, correctly, correct? So, so I can say this, uh, but it, since EB is of bounded type, uh, F and F star will be a bounded type, okay? And then uh, this integration here was to, uh, sorry, F and F star, uh, star will be a bounded type, then I can just go back by Krein's theorem. So F is of natural type, okay? Then I have to measure its exponential type and the exponential type with the maximum of the mean types. But also I can do the same computation because this guy would be this minus that, which would be, uh, um, okay, this guy would be this minus that and the same thing for this guy. So when I take the maximum of the mean types, I know that I get the, the exponential type. So these both have to be less or equal than zero. So then you will conclude that the exponential types less or equal than two pi b. Okay, so we can basically uh, uh, go back in this. So let me not do it in here. So and conversely, if uh, f belongs in here, then uh, f over e b and f star over e b are of bounded type. And since EB is of bounded type, so both are of bounded type. And then by Krein's theorem, F is of 
explanation type and it's easy to show. Oops. To show that uh, the type of F will have to be less or equal than two by B, right? Similar computations, okay? So now you have uh, that the Bailey Venus space has this other characterization. Okay. Um, and this allowed me, so this, so if you think about how uh, you could generalize the Perron spaces, uh, sorry, Bailey Venus space in a way, then uh, you should come up with some similar uh, equivalent definitions and then figure out which one, so you go in the list, this, this, and this, and each one can be easily generalized. And it seems that, that these two last ones could be easily generalized. Uh, this, uh, uh, this last one, which was just proved, uh, and this other one here, okay? And in the end, we will show that you could do similar, like the Paley Venus space, you could do the definition for the De Bruyne space in general, like this thing here. Okay. Um, any questions? Okay, so now we have our De Bruyne space. And what we want to know is if it's a Bunnick space. Okay. So, um, so before we go further, let me define um, the inner product. Okay, so which would make sense in L2 and in LP, we just, I do, we just use as a notation. Um, so, so let me define here the coronal function. So, uh, so you always keep the Taylor Venus space in mind. In the Taylor Venus space, you had this uh, sign. Uh, x over x, which if you translate, would become the kernel function or the reproducing kernel for the space, okay? So in the same way, you would like to have a reproducing kernel here. And uh, it turns out that you can define it very explicitly in terms of this function e, okay? So, so, so maybe to define first the notation, so if So if you have uh, F belonging to H P of E and G belonging to H Q of E. And in this class, I will always write P and Q for the uh, exponents and they will always be dual to each other. Okay. Uh, then I uh, will write this thing, oh, I could put a subscript E here to point that I'm doing this with a function E, but I, I will usually, I will just drop it. Okay, so that would be it. So this would be finite if F is in uh, HP and G is in LQ just by holders inequality. So this is a proper thing. And if P equals Q equals two, then this act is actually a linear product in H2, which makes the H2, uh, the brown space, a Hebert space. Uh, and another side comment in the book, you would just see H, uh, just whenever you see an H in the book, just put a two on top and that would be my H2. Uh, so let me define the kernel function. So what would be the kernel function? So I will always write E of Z as AZ, E minus I, D, Z. Okay, where, and you can do that with any entire function where A and B are real entire, which, uh, when I say real entire, I mean a function which is real on the real line. That means it assumes only real values on the real line. 
so a of x belongs to real n if x is on the real n. Okay, you can always do that for any function. A simple way of doing that is just defining like this and be like this. Okay. And then I would define the kernel function. And that would be the reproducing kernel of the space. And there are two ways of writing this, the identical. One is with the E function. And you will just have to memorize this kernel. And the other way is, is when you write E as uh, A minus I B, and you realize if you take star in the function E, you just change this minus here by plus. That will be E star, just put a plus here. And then if you work through the computations, you will get the function B Z B dot bar times A Z. B dot divided by pi z minus w bar. Okay, so it's always good to keep in mind the Pelevina case. So this would be equal in the Pelevina case to what? Well, in the Pelevina case, the function is the function e b, uh, which will be what? Will be cosine of two pi b z minus i sine of 2 pi b z, okay, by Euler's uh, identity. So then if you throw these functions here, so the function a will be cosine and the function b will be the sine. And if you just throw these guys in here, you will get exactly sine, you will get a sine, well, you will get you will get a cos and then you get sorry you get sine here and cos and then sine here and cos but then you use a trigonometric identity the, the sign for the the sign of the difference and then you can uh, uh, compact everything together in just one simple thing okay which is always good to keep in mind. So it works. It's it, the formula, everything is consistent. That's the important bit. Okay, great. So in the pale in space, we have a nice, a nice thing. Okay. So that's the kernel function. So what the kernel function does so that would be uh, theorem 19. Uh, which I will, again, in the book, the Brunswick is only do that for uh, the uh, L2, the Hubert space uh, case, I would do for LP. So let E be a Hermit Biele function. So we write HP for a Hermit Biele class, and I would just say that to shorter denotation and that one last trick of MP less than infinity. Um, again, uh, infinity is always a, a tricky case. You, can, you can't uh, um, work with that, but uh, there's always tricks to work with that. Then, oh, another notation that I will use, I will often use you will often write kwz as kwc, okay? And I will switch between these two notations. Okay, so q will be the dual exponent. So q will be anything 
bigger than one, and that's so equal to infinity. So k will be bounded as a function for each w, for each, for as a function of z. So therefore, I can integrate against uh, uh, any L1 function, but I can't integrate against an L infinity function because kw is not L1. As you can see, you just have like one over x kind of thing in k, which won't be integrable. So that, that's the reason why. And we have that fw equals f k w, which is a little right explicitly. For every f in h k v. Okay. So if we go to H2, uh, which is the case we always have to keep in mind as well, the Hubert space case, uh, what I'm saying is that the reproducing kernel for each W belongs to the H2 space, which would be P equals Q equals two. It belongs, and moreover, the inner product between a function in the space with that reproducing kernel uh, realizes the evaluation operator. So this guy here, you can think as a devaluation operator. You take, a, sorry, you take an F and you just evaluate at a point, FW. And then uh, I'm saying that by Re's, this is continuous. And therefore by Re's representation, it, it has to be the inner product against the vector. That vector is KW. And then that guy is the reproducing kernel. Okay. Let me write that. So if P equals Q equals two, KW belongs to H2, is the reproducing kernel um, of H2. Okay. Let me prove that result. So first I have to show that this, this thing belongs to the space, okay? So, um, so I have to test if KW, when I divide by E, is a bounded type in the upper half plane, and also KW, when I take the star, and divide by E is also a bounded type. And this, both these functions have non-positive mean type. And then I have to test if it's integrable. If it's uh, when I divide by E and compute this LP norm or LQ norm, what I'm saying here, that this thing is finite. Okay, so let's, so let's do that. So the first thing to note is note that if I do the star in KW, I just get KW bar, okay, by the formula. So let me look at the formula. So let's see this formula here. If I do star, then this function doesn't change in Z because this is real entire. And also this doesn't change, but this bar here would be removed. This bar would be removed and this bar here would be removed, okay? But that's the same thing as, um, using taking this this kernel as it is and put the bar here because then when you put the double bar in a real entire function it vanishes both bars vanish okay which was what we got so then using this you can also do a similar computation with this other uh, representation you get this so i only need to show to show that KW divided by E is of bounded type in the upper half plane and a non-positive mean type.
for all W in C. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so that uh, will guarantee the, the, the bounded type condition, then I have to verify the integration of the line. Okay. So maybe I should say this. Cipher and KW over E belongs to LP on the line. Okay. And then one thing, and then you, this is basically a computation. Then one thing you note is that when I do this, so we go back to this representation here, and basically I take divide by this term here. What I get, and I will get this term divided by this. Okay, so we get E star over E, and then again, also E star over E, but with a conjugate. So if you do the computation, you will get one minus theta of Z and theta of W um, bar divided by two pi I W bar minus Z, where theta is the function E star of z divided by e of z, which we know is well defined in the half half plane. Uh, so this would be a meromorphic function because well, e could have zeros on the real line and also in the lower half plane. In the upper half plane, this is nice and well defined. And we know that this is strictly less than one if uh, z, z is in the upper half plane. Okay. Um, yes. So then, uh, then you see, well, if W is in the upper half plane, okay, if W is in the upper half plane, then um, this function here is a bounded type in the upper half plane because we'll just have here a polynomial, the polynomial is always a bounded type. So to show that this, this bit here is a bounded type as a function of Z, okay, so I'm just, as a function of Z, this is just merely constant. Uh, this guy will be a bounded type in the upper half plane because the polynomial, one is a bounded type. So just have to figure out if this function here is a bounded type as a function of Z in the upper half plane. And it is as long as this doesn't explode, okay? Uh, as long as W is not a zero of E, because if it's a zero of E, then you have that uh, theta could be infinity. But again, if it's a zero of E, then you could just uh, uh, remove this factor here, which are divided here, multiply both sides, then you would eliminate that problem. Okay, and then you can proceed with the same argument. Okay, so uh, so from this, from this, see that k w z divided by e of z is of bounded type in the upper half plane for any w in c. Okay. Basically because the, this function here is bounded by one. So great, so what's the mean type? Well, the mean type of KW divided by E should be what? Well, it's a quotient of two functions of bounded type. Polynomials have mean type zero. It's another problem in the book. And then it's uh, the mean type of a difference, which would be less or equal than a maximum of the mean types. This has mean type zero. 
So this would be less or equal than the mean type of this function. But this function is bounded by one, less than one. So when I take the log of it, it will be negative, less or equal than zero. So this would be less or equal than the mean type of theta, which is less or equal to zero. Okay, so it has no positive mean type. Great. So now all the conditions, bounded type conditions are satisfied. And now if I fix a W, let's say a W which is not a, uh, yeah, yeah just, just, just multiply both sides by, by, by EW. Okay. So this thing is will now be well-defined because if it's a zero of, of E, if W is a zero V, when you just, you just multiply this, these terms, you have a zero here, but when you multiply with this guy, you have a cancellation and something will survive and it will be something times theta of C, okay? So if I want to integrate this thing on the real line, if you put the T here, if you put the T here, Okay, so this thing will be integrable because basically as a function of t, this thing here is bounded by one. Actually, it as the moduli equals to one on the real line. Okay, so this whole bit would be bounded by something which depends on w only. Okay, and this thing here belongs to LQ for any Q greater than one. So this belongs to LQ on the line if Q is greater than one, obviously. The only problem would be if I put a W, which is a zero of this guy, but then as I said before, just multiply both sides and then there will be a constellation here. You just still have this guy divided by something. And when I, I and if it's a real zero, for instance, that would only be the only problem. Then uh, you have here a quotient, but then the function will be differentiable this is a Newton, Newton's quotient. So at the point, the function will be continuous and you just, you can integrate it as well, okay? So you have to separate in cases when this is a zero of, of, of E, and W is a zero of E. And also if it's a real zero, then you have to do something else. But in the end, you can conclude. It's, I, I think I already did sort of these things before. Okay. So the main reason is just because uh, this guy is less or equal than one and you have something here if it's like one over T. Okay, great. So this belongs to the space. So now how can we prove that identity? Okay. So, so now this part is more or less the same as we did before. So we'll do it again. And this will follow from uh, Cauchy's formula for functions of bounded type, okay? So now let F belonging to HP of E. So recall that what I wanted to do was to prove that K belongs to the space. I just did it and now I want to prove, now I want to prove this identity here. Okay, as any identity uh, like this, um, you usually have to use some kind of Cauchy formula. Okay, and we do have one for functions of bounded type. So that's the one we have to use. So then what do we know? We do know that F over E is a bounded type in the perhaps plane and on the line, belongs to LP. So my version of Cauchy's formula for functions of bounded type, which would, would be, I guess, theorem 12. I also did for LP. In the Burns book is also, is only L2, but also did, I, I proved it for LP. So by theorem 12, what do we have? Uh, we can represent 
this guy by a Cauchy integral formula that will be 2 pi i t minus w dt minus infinity infinity and that will be equal to what? Two things f uh, over e of w uh, if w is in the upper half plane and if w is in the lower half plane then it's identical to zero. Okay, that was uh, Cauchy's integral formula that we proved. So let me rearrange terms. Let me multiply everything by EW. And then we'll just have F here. Okay. And then we can do the same for F star over E. And then we get the same thing, but for F star, which on the real line will be just F bar. And that would be F bar bar, which is F star. And this is in the upper half plane and zero otherwise. Okay, I did a very similar thing in another theorem. So now we, what, I, uh, what I want to do is just replace in the second formula, I want to replace W by W bar and then conjugate everything. So then I will change this or remove this guy and then I conjugate everything. So let's do that on the left hand side first. So if I do that, then I get uh, E star here. I lose this conjugate. And there is an I here, so we get a minus. On this right hand side, this goes away, but then this changes to minus and this changes to plus, which instead of doing this, I will just put the zero here and the F there. Okay. And now you can see we can add the formulas because on the upper half plane, I just have f, and in the lower form, I had zero. And in here, I have f, but in the upper form, I had zero. So it's just adding. We get that fw equals, and if you add everything, you will see and do the computation, you will see that you will get exactly the reproducing kernel. Okay, and this would work if W is complex number, but not real. Okay. And of course, uh, adding a formula is uh, plus some computations. Okay, but then we see that we can easily extend to the whole uh, complex plane just by limiting procedure because, well, you know that your kernel is well defined if W is real, of course, and one T. Uh, so if you go back in the kernel here, if W is real, and then this is T, so if W is real and uh, this guy here is T, then uh, what can happen is that they could be equal, but then this thing also will be equal to zero. So they have a cancellation. But there is like a, a, some technicality to overcome just to justify that I can take W uh, to some real, uh, point zero and this formula still works. There is some justification, but you can do it. So you can just do that. Okay. So there we go. That, that finishes the proof. Okay. Any questions here?
So nice. So now we know that we have a reproducing kernel. And as a, a, a remark, We have some nice inequality. We know that uh, f of w. So let me do two inequalities. So the first one is well, the reproducing kernel kwz equals what? You can do it with itself. Um, so I'm, I'm always doing it on the right. So it means that I have to put z here. Yes. Um, let me see if that's right. So this is supposed to be what? This is supposed to be the evaluation of the guy KW. So it's supposed to be this, yes. At the point Z, which is supposed to be this. Yes, correct. Okay. So we do have this. In particular, what we have is, uh, so we can just apply Cauchy's inequality. And we have the KWZ squared is less or equal to the norm of kw squared in h2. So let me maybe move this thing here. And then again, the norm in h2. But what's the norm? The norm is the inner product uh, of the function with itself. But since it's a reproducing kernel, we just evaluate at the point. So this would be exactly kww and kzz. Okay. So we have this nice inequality to keep in mind. And we do have another one. This is L2, L2, but I could do, I could do just kw without the square, I could do just hp. Uh, and they kz hq. That's another one. Okay. Uh, and maybe a third one would be well, if I do fw, I know that this is the model i of f kw. So I could just do f hp if f belongs to hp. And then I do kw. HQ, so this is for F in HP. Okay, in particular, you see that, uh, so, okay, so this would be equal to less or equal if P was two uh, to F H2, and this norm we know how to compute is just KWW uh, square root because I'm not doing the square of the norm here. Okay, so in particular, you see that the map that takes F into the evaluation at the point W is continuous and you know how to estimate its norm. Its norm is less or equal than this thing, which in L2 would be just the square root of the reproducing kernel at the point W, W. Okay, which in the Pelevina case, it will be a sink and you have to evaluate at the, uh, the point W, W, and then you can easily figure out if, what, what that's gonna get. It's gonna get something exponential if W is has a complex part. If W is real, you're gonna get just one, or maybe you, you get, you're getting, sorry, you're getting like uh, 2B if, if, if the type is 2 pi B the square root of 2b, to be correct. So you can figure out what happens here in the paler Venus space. Okay. okay. So we still have half an hour. So in this last half an hour, I want to prove the alternative definition of, of uh, the brown spaces. And this is not on the book. And this I would take from a, a paper of Baranov. Okay. Which was the first that to define these ones, I guess, for LP, the brown spaces, um, uh, which is the following. 
Uh, so theorem HP, HP of E, and this will work for any P, uh, is the space of F entire and uh, F star over E and F over E both belong to the Hardy space HP and the upper half point, which was the same as we had also for the Paley Venus space. Okay. So that requires some tricks. Uh, And if I show this, uh, this is a consequence, if I show this, then it will be very easy to show that the space is complete because it's easy to show that this here is a closed space in the, uh, um, in the Hardy space when you put the LP norm on the real line, okay? And therefore, uh, since HP will be isometric, to this because, well, the norm in here would be the norm on the real line when LP norm on the real line when it's take F over E to the LP norm. And in this space is the same norm because this guy is in there. So the norm would be this on the real line and also for this, okay. So, so in the end, I will make this remark. Um, but basically what you're saying that this is isometric uh, also, not just as sets. Okay, which is nice is another way of to generating the the the, the, the burn spaces, which is also similar to what we had in the paleofinite space. So proof. Okay, um, so let's start. So if you have a function in here, so we know by Cauchy's formula. that, and, and, and this was in my proof of Cauchy's formula, which also worked for P equals infinity, that uh, F over E is basically the convolution of F over E with the Poisson kernel if Z equals X plus I Y, okay, Y greater than zero, okay. So why, how, how do I know this? Because well, F over E is of bounded type, okay? And, and is LP on the line, okay? And then by the, my proof of uh, Cauchy's formula, I can always represent it like this with the convolution of a Poisson kernel. And then the, the, here was the trick. I mean, you write the convolution of the Poisson, the, the Poisson kernel as a difference of two things. And the first bit will give you the Cauchy formula as we had before, like with the T minus Z, and the other bit would be identically zero. And then that's what that's how we got the, the Cauchy formula. So this was the, the previous step, and this previous step also worked for P equals infinity, as I noted. Okay. So so we know that, then therefore we can just take the LP norm. as a function of X and that will be what? Uh, and if I take the soup in Y, Y positive, okay. Well, I can just, uh, well, I can just use here um, the fact that if I take the LP norm of a convolution, it will be, <clears throat> that's so equal to the LP norm of the first term times the L1 norm of the second, but the L1 norm of the second would be equal to one always. So this will always be less or equal than the LP norm on the real line. But if, since I'm taking the soup, it will be end up, soup in Y, will be end up to be identical. And this is finite because this is just the norm of F and HP, which is finite. So F of E belongs to the hardest space. C plus. And similarly, F star of E 
belongs to uh, the hard space. Um, Yes, okay. And then um, there is one bit of um, trouble here. Maybe somebody can notice. Um, I'm not using the fact that a function has no negative mean type, no positive mean type, am I? I should use at some point. Yeah, but this is working the way it is, okay. Um, Okay, then it will be only in the, okay, I think it will be okay because in the converse, it, uh, it will come up. Yes, in the converse, it will come up. Okay, so, so then it will be fine. Okay, so let me uh, re-explain uh, this. So F is in HP, we do know that F divided by E is a bounded type and um, it is LP on the line. And if we go to theorem 12, I guess this is, okay. this is the only condition we have. Oh yes, oh, yes, the mean type has to be non-positive. Okay, yes, of course. Uh, so we know that okay, by the proof theorem 12 that we can represent this. So theorem 12 has the assumption that the function, uh, um, yes, uh, the main type is not positive, okay. So great, so we are using the fact that the function has no positive mean type. Okay. Similarly, we have this and moreover, um, like, I mean, from this, you can also see, well, this, this bit here, let me put here, this bit here is the norm of F of E in the space HP, okay? So we're actually showing that the norm in the space HP equals the norm in the, the De Bruyne space. But anyway, let me go back. So, so similarly, F star of A belongs to there. So now conversely, if uh, let's say F E and F star over E belong to the Hardy space HP, Okay, so I have to split this thing in two bits. Um, yes, so I have to split this thing in two bits. The first is, so assume that, uh, uh, P is greater or equal than two. 
Okay, then I will do P less two, uh, less three equal to G. So then I will do a trick, uh, and the trick is the following. Um, let G epsilon of Z be this function here. squared, okay, and uh, E epsilon of Z, just what, what I defined before, but it will multiply by, uh, maybe it's not a good notation because I use this one, that one before. Um, and again, just stick with me, it's not a good notation because I used that before, but anyway, let me uh, E epsilon be this guy, okay? So in particular, on the real line, it has the same norm as the function e, okay? Then it's easy to see that uh, f times g epsilon divided by e epsilon, and also f star times g epsilon divided by e epsilon, they now belong to h2 of c plus, okay? So if recall that the only thing that I need to show, I already have the condition on the line being LP. So the only thing I have to show is that the functions are bounded type and have non-positive mean type, okay? Um, so then I'm, I'm allowed to do certain tricks for that. So why, why this is the case? Well, let me do just one. Uh, so if you do g f g epsilon, let's say x plus i y, uh, and you divide by e epsilon x plus i y, and you do let's say the norm l two in the variable x, then what I can do is I can apply uh, some holders inequality. So this would be a product because uh, these, this function here is also a product of two things. So I have f over e and I have g epsilon over the exponential bit. So I apply holders inequality for these two. And then what I get is f over e x plus i epsilon. Uh, sorry, this is just two in x. And then times the other one, which would be just g epsilon x plus i y divided by the exponential. And the correct exponent here is L2P over P minus two in X, okay? And uh, well, this function here, uh, when I take the model, I won't depend on X, it will be just an exponential in Y. And then I would take the LP of this guy along X, which uh, it will grow exactly as we got uh, the result we got for the exponential here. So it's easy to show that this, this thing here uh, is uniformly bounded in terms of y, okay. Oh, this is not L2, sorry. This is LP, of course. I'm doing L2 and then P and 2P, 2P. So the, the relation that you should use here for holders inequality is that one over two is one over P plus one over two P divided by P minus two. Okay. So this is holders inequality. Okay, so then this is less or equal than some constant, as I said. which I know is uniformly finite, uniformly bounded, sorry, because Fe belongs to HP. So therefore this function belongs to H2. So that's just one bit of the computation you have to do for the other guys. Okay. Okay, so since I know this, then uh, I can apply Cauchy formula so again, I have two functions in the, uh, these two bits here. Oh, this is also, so this would be star here, but G star equals G itself because G is real on the real line, okay? 
So I could just put this. But it should be in the start. Anyway, uh, I did show that whenever you have a form a function in here, you do have Cauchy formula in the upper half plane. Uh, just this exactly the way I did it for the reproducing kernel uh, property, you could do for now for these two functions using the Cauchy formula in the Hardy space. Okay, so then this would imply by Cauchy's formula in the Hardy space that I can exactly write FW G epsilon W as uh, this bit here. And you may be wondering, well, you could do that also for LP because this, this is true in LP as well. Yeah, you, you would be right. But now I want to do an inequality which won't be available in LP. We'll take the square here and then as a slight holders inequality put, put L2 in this bit. Okay, so then I would do F G epsilon L2 on the line or divided by E. So F G epsilon Oh, this would be E epsilon, sorry. And this would be K epsilon, where K epsilon is the producing kernel associated with E epsilon. Okay, so this would be epsilon, and this would be LP, and then, oh, sorry, L2. And this would be uh, what? K epsilon L2, which would be exactly this in L2, but I'm putting a square on both sides. And we computed this, this was my remark. This guy is just K epsilon of WW. So let me erase that. That would be just K epsilon of WW, okay? So if I want to, uh, so recall what I want to do is to show that this function here is a bounded type when I divide by E. It has no positive mean type. So, uh, so this would be what? Just a constant, which would depend on epsilon in a way. And this would be K epsilon WW, okay? But I'm dividing by this thing here is squared. So now I want to put this in the upper half plane, okay? Because I want to show that again, that F divided by the piece that we have here, E, ever, this is a bounded type. So this is my aim. So this is in the upper half plane, and this is a simple computation to do, that this would be some C epsilon one minus, and then that function theta shows up and shows up squared because recall that was state of Z times state of W and everything bar. So if Z equals W, you get a square. And below you get exactly just four pi. So below, let me write. So this was two pi I, W bar minus Z, but then Z equals W. And this would be four pi Y, okay? so. W is X plus I Y in this bit. Okay, so it's a computation I have to do, but uh, I'm just, I'm, I'm claiming it's true. And then, well, you know that theta in the upper half plane is less than equal to one, then just bound this by the constant divided by four pi Y. Okay. And now it's easy to show, and then I would leave as a, a um, uh, reading exercise. So using theorem 11 from the book, which I didn't show, and you also can see also uh, the proof of theorem 20, if you want some help. Uh, we can show using this bound that this guys here are a bounded type 
in the upper half plane and non positive. mean type. Okay, and I will leave this as a reading exercise. Okay, so you, you could just read uh, Theorem 20 first and then you see what it does that there and then you go, go to Theorem 12, etc. Okay, but anyway, you can show that whenever you have a bound like this in the upper half plane, um, then you can show that the function is of bounded type. And then if you have this, well, g epsilon divided by the exponential, let me go back. So this is a function that pays within a space. So we do know that if I divide this by the correct exponential, which would be by this guy, this would be a bounded type and non positive mean type. Okay. But actually, the mean type would be zero. Because you can, this function here is a bounded type itself, because this guy is also a bounded type. Um, so then you can compute the mean type of the quotient. So the mean type of g epsilon divided by this thing, this is what I'm saying, is zero, because this would be just a limit in the vertical line going up in the imaginary axis. And this sign would grow exactly like e to 2 pi epsilon y there, exactly as this bit. Okay, so the mean type would be zero. So this shows that f over e is of bounded type because the, the, the other bit, which is multiplying this, this thing, is of bounded type. And the mean type of this whole bit, which would be E and this, the exponential, equals the mean type of this, which should be less or equal than zero, sorry. Plus the mean type of the reminder, plus the mean type of, of not the, the other term, but that is zero, as I said. So the mean type of f over e is less than or equal than zero. And then, then similarly, f e is a bounded type and its mean type is less than or equal than zero. Okay. So that would deal with the case p greater or equal than two. Any questions here? Okay, so in case one less or equal than p less than two, well, then you have to uh, do a certain trick. So do, you do the same trick as we did before. This should be star, it's the same. Okay, but now this is in H1. Okay, so why this is on H1? Because, well, if you just integrate this bit, okay, what I can do is I can um, just do uh, Holder's inequality and you will get an LP in this part and then LQ in the other part. So there will be an LP in this, so you would do LP. And then the other bit would be g epsilon divided by the exponential. You would do LQ, okay? And this is always finite and uniformly bounded. Uh, so therefore, and, and so this is LP, okay? So this would be H1. And again, by the same, uh, by Cauchy's formula, which we have available for any P, we have, Uh, equal to f g epsilon k epsilon w. Okay, so then uh, this would imply. So now we would divide this by e epsilon w. And I would just simply do f 
one here. So this would be what? H1. We don't know if it's an H1, so to be completely rigorous, I should just write like this, a one on the line. And then in the right hand side, you get the soup. Uh, but since I divided by that, um, so we get the soup and the T on the real line of K epsilon WT divided by E epsilon T E epsilon W. We can even put a bar here. Okay. So this is the inner product and what I'm just doing is I'm taking the L1 on a bit and the L infinity in the other bit. Okay, but then we have a formula for this. This is what? This is a one minus theta r theta t divided by two pi i then w minus w bar minus c, recall the w here is always x plus i y. And I want to know when things when y is greater than zero. So if I do the model i here, okay, so w is in the upper half plane. So this is less or equal than one. This is on the line, so it's equal, model i is equal to one. So as long as w is in the upper half plane, I can easily bound this by something like a constant divided by y. Okay, uh, if I'm taking the soup in T, so let's say the soup in T, the soup in T real, uh, then, I, then you just bound the, the numerator by a constant and then the denominator, uh, you just take T equals X, that would be the, the worst case scenario. X would be the, this, this guy here and you would get something like over y. Okay, so in the end you get so fw g epsilon w e epsilon w is less or equal than some constant over y and then now the same the same procedure as before shows that f over e and f star over e are both a bounded type in the upper half plane and their mean type is less or equal than zero. Okay, and that finishes the proof. So the, the whole idea was the fact that uh, I can't estimate the norm LP of these guys here well. The only two norms I know to estimate well are the ones on L2 and the, the one on L1. So that's what I did here. I drilled everything to L2, I made everything L2, so I could estimate the L2 guy here, which was simple. I could use this formula and get something over Y. And in the other case, I send everything to L1. So I have L1 here and then I can put L infinity. L infinity is another one I can estimate well because I have this formula here. And then I can just bound by something over Y. Okay, so I could estimate anything between one and, and two, uh, the norm between one and two well, but in higher spaces it will be difficult. So the trick is just to send either to L1 or L2, and I can do that by, by multiplying by this uh, auxiliary function here. Any questions in this proof? Any things that look uh, not okay? Okay, so this basically finishes the class of today. I just want to make uh, the final uh, result, which would be, uh, Theorem 21 from the book that uh, each, each, which the Burns is only shows for uh, two, P equals two. 
So it's a Banach space, N1 P equals two is a Hilbert space. And the proof is uh, basically I will leave as an exercise, but, but now we know that HP of E is uh, isometric and isomorphic to HP of C plus intersection theta HP of C minus, where HP of C minus, you could just define exactly the same way as we defined uh, uh, the hardest space, but only in the lower half plane instead of the upper half plane. Um, and what is the map that we're using here is the following. We take F and just map to F over E, okay? And why is that true? Because, well, we just saw it. We just saw that F over E always belongs to this space. And what is F over E belonging to this? Well, if, uh, so F over E belongs derogation to theta HP of C minus, that is the same to say that uh, F over E is theta, which is the function E star over E, times some function G in HP of C minus. So you could cancel these bits. And then it is the same to say that F over E star uh, belongs to HP of C minus. Okay, G in HP of C minus. But then uh, this is the same as the saying that if you take the star that F star over E belongs to HP of C plus, which is what we proved, okay? So then we have, uh, so, so then we have this, and the way you should understand this bit here is these are, uh, let me write it here. The way you should understand this bit is these are functions F in HP of C plus such that F over theta extends as entire and F over theta end up belonging to HP of C minus. And F over theta belongs to HP of C minus. Or a theta, this is the guy. Yeah? This is the theta function. Okay. Uh, so this is what's called a model space. If you go in, in the literature, that's the name you will find. Okay. And it's easy to show. Uh, that this is a closed subspace and uh, therefore um, is easy to show that this is complete. Okay. And we'll leave as an exercise for you. And it's basically the same thing we did to prove that the Hardy space was complete. You take a Cauchy sequence and you do whatever, use a, a Poisson representation in there or Cauchy representation, you do the appropriate inequalities and so on. We did that already. It's easy to show that uh, HP C plus intersection theta HP C minus is a closed subspace of HP C plus. Okay. Um, and that would finish the proof and then that would show that this is complete. If you, if you go in the book and you look for theorem 21, the brings is so in a totally different way. But if you pay attention, it's basically the same way we did as for the Hardy space. You take Cauchy sequence, as I, as I said, and then you show and you can extract, uh, it converges uniformly and then you can extract a function which is entire and then you have to prove certain things. And then he uses theorem 20 to, to prove that the function you get is actually in the space. 
But anyway, um, this is a, an alternative way. Um, any questions in, in this thing? So great, so I hope, I hope you enjoyed the class and I hope, uh, so for now on, uh, it's time for the study, focusing on the brain spaces, so half of the, the, this, the class, the whole lectures, um, half of this semester was just introductory part and now we will move to the, the brown space territory and we will stay there. And then hopefully we do some nice applications. That was the end, okay? Um, if you don't have any questions, then I can stop recording. Okay, see you Friday. <laughs>